Blog Talk Radio. And tonight, our favorite show is Voltron, Legendary Defender, brought to you by the good people at Netflix. Tonight, we will be discussing Season 4, which dropped on October 13th. And I am your host, your mandator reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Radledge. Joining me tonight is the... uh, co-host of the common writer uh how do you do something japanese i'm turning japanese for you podcast and the co-host of the metal hammer of doom pretty cool fruit who really knows where his towel's at mr robert cooper how do you do sir in fact, uh, my towel actually hangs on an old 18-inch tube TV that I have sitting beside my regular TV. Because why the fuck not? Why? <laughs> why do you still have a tube TV in your room? Are you like, you know, <laughs> like third, like it, it, fucking 80? <laughs> yeah. y- yes. I am. I am practically. I am fucking 80. <laughs> you know, interesting you on Netflix. Order? You am, I hoard, am I a hoarder? Am I a hoarder? <laughs> no, I'm a, a pack rat. There's a difference. I can throw things away. I just like having large collections mm-hmm. of things because uh, I have like 300 C. Uh, I know we've had this discussion years ago, but I still have my 300 CDs, a whole bookcase full of anime, a whole bookcase full of manga, fucking hundred something video games, and a bookcase of books. When I move out, fuck me. Yeah, you're in, you're in trouble, bud. I've been there. I've done that, so I don't have that shit anymore. Um, and it's just, like a hundred funny to me, which it, cause it's going to disappear eventually. My wife's sitting. <laughs> well, my, my wife's sitting right next to me, and and, and she knows that if there were a tube TV in this house, it would not last very long. <laughs> She's shaking her head. Um, let me ask you a question. Uh, of the TV, of the of the T-shirts, do you have? Do you have uh, any offensive Cradle of Filth T-shirts? I do not have the Jesus as a cunt T-shirt. I <laughs> reference that one. I, I, I reference that shirt often. <laughs> uh, that is my. We we spent uh, several minutes on Monday, actually, as we were recording pl- the Planet Hulk podcast. Just talking about Cradle of Filth t-shirts. It was a fun time for all, except for Ronnie Adams, who I'm pretty sure wanted to hang himself. But anyway. <laughs> uh, it's like at work, I drew a pentagram in the uh, sawdust on the saw, and they're like, don't do that. I'm like, no, hail Santa. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wanted the hail Santa t-shirt, but my wife said no. Um, I wanted what that to be my Christmas. To church? We don't go to church. We keep, we've talked about it a few times, and, at, and now whenever my wife brings it up, I just laugh at her. But um, yeah, she won't she won't let me wear she won't let me buy the Hail Santa uh, Christmas T shirt. Something about it not being appropriate. I, I, I mean, you could just start <laughs> going pure like you can just go atheist under me like well, uh, Christmas, and just to be a dick, you could just be a dick doing that. Uh, no. You know, uh, I, I, I really. 
I was, was going to say that one of my favorite things are heavy metal uh, Christmas, ugly Christmas sweaters, but they get overcharged right. and they're like fifty, sixty dollars a piece. Yeah, my so Star Wars was, one was like seventy bucks. <laughs> and it, uh, and, I, and, I almost, well and I well and I and I had a panic attack wearing it because I was like I was too fat for the sweater and it fit really tight and I couldn't breathe. And my wife will tell you I like legit had a panic attack. You're like fuck. Too fat for sweater. Made mistake, but too expensive. Must wear. <laughs> it was well. We wore it for Christmas pictures. Is why I bought it. Um, all right. Let Let's talk Voltron here. You were telling me a story before we went to air tonight that you were wearing a Power Ranger T-shirt. Why don't you pick it up from there? Okay. So um, I'm taking my vest off because I work at Lowe's Home Improvement. God bless them. Uh, and uh, my coworker is like, wait a minute. Is that Power Rangers? Yeah. Power Rangers ripped off Voltron. And I, I looked at him and said, well, actually, you know, like every fucking nerd <laughs> loves to do. I did the, well, actually gave him the excuse me finger and pushed up my imaginary glasses. I told him, actually, Voltron was based off a of Beast King Go Lion, which came out in 1983. The Super Sentai series was created by Shotaro Ishinomori. And uh, the first series to feature a giant robot was uh, was at Battle Fever J, and it was in 1979. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, I didn't know." I'm like, "Well, no, you do." Not to mention, like, what he, the, what he should have said was. Nerd. 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 <laughs> Yeah, that's what I oh, yeah. Saying. Well, the well, the funny thing is, like, it's interesting. Uh, Go Lion, which is Voltron, is not that popular in Japan at all. It's just, uh, it was a run-of-the-mill, uh, you know, giant robot anime from the early 80s, which, like, late 70s, early 80s was kind of like that heyday slash, and then moved into, like, a twilight of the, the super robot era. It's, I mean, it's very interesting to, if you want to say they ripped off that, well, shit. I mean, we've had giant robot shows like Giant Robo and uh, Brave Riding and all that stuff way before fucking Voltron. It's, 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 right. it's, it's very interesting because I guess we just have a very mm-hmm. Americanized perspective that when you go and look into what it, you know, what came before it, you can say, you can, hell, you can say it ripped off everything. Fuck, you can say Star Wars in that, uh, isn't like the most creative thing ever. If you go like, well, actually, the well, no, fortress. I, I was gonna say everyone knows that Star Wars was an amalgamation of other people's shit. George Lucas has, has acknowledged that. Um, George Lucas has acknowledged he's a hack who <laughs> stole from others. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, let's let's go ahead and recap what uh, happened in season three. Season three started off with Shiro being missing. Keith assuming the role of the Black Lion, Allura, Allura, Allura assuming the role of the Blue Lion, um, what's his face moving over to the Red Lion, and the Hunk and Pidge just stayed where they were. Uh, so we had a whole shift in who was manning what lion. Um, our villain of the season was Prince Lotor, and it was all about getting the comet to use as material to build new weapons. And that's about where we left off with season three. Is there anything else of, of major importance other than they, they found Shiro eventually uh, that I left out? Mm, not that I'm aware of. Oh. Okay. It is interesting so to season, see our last big bad was not dead. Um, so season four picks up where season three left off. Uh, Keith is still splitting his time between the Blade of Memora and Voltron, which is causing tension with the team. Um, after the, the major victories, um, the major guns, the major victories of season three, Voltron is building a coalition of the willing uh, to fight against the um, Galra Empire that's you know crumbling in certain places. Uh, Hagar, the witch, is still trying to keep the uh, the empire proper going and uh, Lotor as I said before 
still has the material from the comet or has the co- the comet itself. I don't remember the exact details. Uh, so that, that's where we pick things up. Our first episode is Code of Honor. As we said, Keith continues his training with the Blade of Mamora by accompanying them on an intelligence missions in the process, neglecting his duties as the leader of Ultron. When Kalavan reveals that the Gara most likely have a secret supply chain of a new form of quintessence, Keith joins the mission to infiltrate one of the Garrow supply vessels. The Blade discovers that the vessel is a trap once they are aboard, and Regress is killed in a subsequent explosion. Despite this, and Alora's plea for Keith to continue uh, to lead Voltron, Keith continues to spend most of his time with the Blade of Memora. Sometime later, the Paladins receive a distress signal from a rebel convoy under attack by the Galra. The four Paladins struggle to hold up the Galra while Keith is absent. Shiro pleads with the Black Lion to let him pilot it, successfully reestablishing their bond. Shiro reconvenes with the other four lions, and together they form Voltron, which easily destroys the Galra fleet. After the battle, Keith confronts the team and officially steps down as the leader of Voltron, handing the position to Shiro so that he can continue to work with the Blade of Mamora. So, what did you think of this first episode? Um, I like that they show... uh, well, being at Keith there is not very good at splitting his time and that um, I really feel like they were setting up and planting the seeds for Shiro to come back as the black line in kind of the previous season. It's half a season. Let's be honest. Uh, previous <laughs> half a season. Cause I, I felt like them keeping him around. Wasn't, uh, wasn't some coincidence. I always felt like he was coming back. So him coming back and taking over as the black leader of the black line, I really feel like, works. I think with Keith's character, him being kind of the lone being back to the lone wolf does make sense in ways. Um I mean he's always kinda of worked better as that character and really at the end of the day he was not good as as good a leader as Shiro. I mean I think they both would no. probably agree with that. But I would tell you I kind of felt gypped in a way because they spent the first half of this season or season three, whichever you like. Um establishing, you know, Keith's arc as he grew into that role. And then it was like, well, you know, this was like Vince McMahon kind of booking. <laughs> it's like, I'm bored of this. Let's, let's, let's send him back to the, the Blade of Marmora. Um, I'm like, I, then what was the first seven or eight episodes about then? You know, the, so much of that was spent on Keith growing as a character and then... I don't see where any of that growth paid off with the choices they made in this first episode. I'm not saying the episode is bad. The episode was, was very entertaining, and I did enjoy the image of Keith kind of walking into the room and, and all the paladins of Ultron standing with their back to him, you know, <laughs> looking pissed. I also did enjoy Allura, you know, with all of their differences and issues that Allura and Keith have had in the past, you know, for her to be like, hey, this is, you know, Voltron's important. You're important. We love you. Uh, come, you know, you need to come back to us and take this seriously, you know, despite herself. Uh, I thought that was very strong. But the, the, the narrative choice to remove Keith from that position, especially so soon into season four here, I was like, oh, well, I don't, narratively, I didn't find that to be a strong, just strong decision. I can agree with that because <laughs> it is. Uh, now that I think about it, it does kind of. Yeah, it, it does kind of make. It doesn't really actually doesn't make a lot of sense that. You know they built they did build Keith up as a leader they built him, and then uh, all of a sudden he just kind of gets removed from it. But I feel like the writing would be good enough that I think it would it's going to pay off somewhere. I yeah, about, but I mean, I think as we t- as we talk about the rest of the season, where it all leads to with these different factions and everything, and you know, and and this lo- co- this coalition growing larger, like I can accept it. I just it, I, it it's just like I said, I felt a little ripped off given the amount of time spent on this just to abandon it in the first episode later. 
Um, let's move on to Reunion, which is episode two. I'm not going to read the whole thing, because basically all that you need to know here is Pidge finally finds his brother. Um, which is really well, and I her have brother. To, yeah, her, sorry, her brother. Uh, which I have to say, I, I got I teared up during this. You know, um, when they when they finally reunite, I uh, it was a very emotional episode for me. You know, like I don't have a brother out there, you know, and lost in the wilderness that I've been reconnected with. But I I could empathize with the Pidge character and, and her brother. And I and I really enjoyed you know the flashback scenes and what it, what it all led up to, and and they have been building towards this now for you know almost, for almost every season. This has been in the back of Pidge's mind when there was an opportunity to find the brother, she tried to take it, and you know, and I'm glad they finally got around to it, and really added the character to you know it wasn't like we just found the character like they didn't do like a lot of other shows do, where like they find the character but then the character. He's just there for that one episode. You never see him again. Like this, like the character ends up dying or going away or whatever. Like they made the character basically one of, you know, an important part of the coalition um, later on, which, which I enjoyed. But I thought this was a very well-written episode. Yeah, I can, I, I agree with that. Uh, honestly, I was, because I wasn't paying attention to the runtime, I was like, "Oh shit, is he dead?" I could see him pulling that. So uh, when they found him alive, I was like, "Oh shit!" Even though, like, then in retrospect, I'm like, "Damn, they got me." I don't know why I fell for it. <laughs> Nothing in in writing conventions 101, nor like you know, kids television, <laughs> really, uh, <laughs> really should have led me any other way. But yeah, when he came in, I really. I really liked him. Uh, I liked how they kept having flashbacks that really kind of helped build that that helped build on top of what we already know. Like you know, we know Pidge loves her brother, but like just seeing the two of them interact a lot more was really nice. And then uh, when they reunite, it's just it, it's fun. It's really cool. And I like and just like you said, I like them keeping him around, which makes sense, especially with uh, seeing where like the finale kind of was going towards, like a big old everybody form up and I don't know, attack the death star makes a lot of sense. Right. Um, let's move on to, well, let me say this before we move on. They got me too. I, I thought he was dead. And I tell you, I, I think it's the scene in the graveyard where I was like boohoo crying. I'm pretty sure my daughter looked at me. He's like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, yeah, it's so sad. <laughs> Um, did she give you the same confused look as she did when face down ass up <laughs> something like that uh, episode 3 here is Black Sight and really the big thing you get out of this is that Lotor um, Zarkon has come back to life he is revived and he reclaims the Gara throne and he relieves Prince Lotor of duty which I didn't understand this. Maybe you can explain it to me. But, you know, Lotor is trying to build weapons out of the quintessence and all of that, like they did, you know, like they did when they built Voltron. And Zarkon's like, no, fuck your couch. I don't, like, I don't want your stupid machines. And, you know, and I'm taking control. And it, this all leads up to them, like, declaring Lotor as an enemy of the state and saying that if you find him, kill him. And I, and I, I just didn't understand why, like, there didn't seem to be enough in the episode to justify that decision by Zarkon, other than he's like a crazy maniac, <laughs> and, you know, and doesn't want to share power, and, you know, is in, and doesn't see the value in what Lotor's doing. Yeah, uh, I felt like it was for, uh, for what's his nuts? Uh, King douchebag. Let's we'll call him King douchebag. Uh, Zarkon. With that guy, I don't know why I blanked on him. I was like Lotor, no, Lotor, no. Like, the entire <laughs> time, all I could think of was Lotor. Like the, shit, the other Emperor blue guy. Emperor Zarkon. Emperor Zarkon. Em- for fuck's sake. Em- Emperor Zardoz. Whatever. Um, Zardoz. That movie's so <laughs> fucking awful. Zarkon. E A R K O N. Zarkon. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Zarkon. Uh, the, the fake. The fake diamond. Uh, 
<laughs> so yeah, uh, him coming back to power and pretty much being like, "Yeah, Lotor, uh, you suck." Was something that at the while I was watching, I was like, oh, "Okay," like I feel like it makes sense for his character to get back into a power play and not really understand what game Lotor is playing. But then again, I think maybe his game is just so well disguised that by the time Zolt- uh, Z- Zoltar <laughs> found out, uh, he was uh, he, he was just not amused. He was done at that point. Like I feel like when he was ma- they found out he was making super weapons, they should have tried to capture them instead of like boom boom. Just blow that shit up. Yeah, because I feel like, like he, as a character, he would be smart enough to realize that okay, I lost once, maybe we should rethink. But then again, as like a despotic ruler, perhaps that doesn't self reflection isn't always your uh, best suit. <laughs> well, I, I was thinking about this episode, and I was like, so he, they spent the, the, a good part of I want to say season one with Zarkot and going, I want the Black Lion back. I was connected to the Black Lion, and only I know how to ride the Black Lion, and I want the Black Lion. I I, I want the knife. Um, so, and then, you know, they, they he loses control of the Black Lion to Shiro. Uh, Voltron eventually kicks the living shit out of the Kalra Empire. They are on their ass. You would think, like... Like, to me, the the first half of this season, season three, the fact that Lotar's, Lotar's long game is to get the quintessence and to build new weapons to, to fight Voltron, which is, like, indestructible, basically, you would think, you would, you would think he'd see the value in that. that. Like, you know what? Our whole empire is based on the fact that nobody is more powerful than us. And then they revive Voltron. Not only do they revive Voltron, but they're able to use it effectively. We need something that's going to match Voltron's power. And that's what Lotor, I think, was trying to do. And then they're like, nope, you're not taking your job seriously as ruler of interim ruler of the Empire. Uh, so fuck you, you're going to die. That's like, did, did you not see what he was doing? Did you not understand? It, it was... As well as this show is written, I feel like the some of the narrative choices are a little sketch this this time around. Uh, yeah, uh, where it leads to, I'm like, okay, this is. But I had to kind of sit through those narrative pitfalls to get to the, this point, which I feel like with the character that Lotor is, kind of that you know that really cool villain. You know the cool vil- You know the cool villain, the one that like you know. He's going to, uh, he's really cool, and he's going to be super popular, and they're going to make, like, dolls about him, and the show's going to be hip about him. <laughs> you know, we, we all get those characters every once in a while, like Darth Vader. Uh, you, you know eventually there's going to be a slight face turn, at least. So, them, him stabbing Lotor, well, not really stabbing him in the back, but just uh, trying to get rid of him, even though Lotor has a plan. Uh, <laughs> I don't like it, but I feel like in terms of marketability and just... Kind of where a lot of these shows tend to go. It makes sense. Up next is one of my favorite episodes. This is our mall episode for this season. What I mean by that, if you followed our previous podcast where we talked about Voltron, there seems to be one episode every season, you know, like like it was in the first, where Voltron goes to the mall. You know, there, it's something silly. It plays into the overall narrative, but like minimally so. Um, and, and it's just them kind of having fun, taking a break from the quasi-seriousness of the story arc. You know, it isn't all war, war, war all the time. They take a break and have some fun with the show. Well, that's what they did for episode four, which is the Voltron show. And to sum it up for you, uh, Koron uh, books a bunch of events for Voltron to build up uh, popularity among the newly freed masses so that they'll join the coalition. You know, they're, they're going on a, a tour of friendship and it doesn't work out uh, quite the way he wants it to in the beginning. So he starts doing cocaine, essentially. <laughs> he he, he gets into that white powder. <laughs> yes. 
He he does have a bit of cocaine, goes fucking crazy, and starts booking these ridiculous shows. But those but these ridiculous shows have a great response to them, you know. And you know, Voltron's tour becomes wildly successful. Unfortunately, like like you know, like I'm making a joke about it. It's not really cocaine. It's like he, I don't remember what it was called, but it was like some sort of like space slug that gets into his brain and gives him like all these great creative ideas. Um, it also drives him crazy because cocaine's a hell of a drug. Uh, <laughs> the quote, the great Rick James. They eventually cure him of his habit and he starts thinking clearly again. But by that point, the tour is pretty much over and they've successfully won over the masses they were trying to bring into the coalition. The coalition grows. That's, <laughs> that's the sum total of this episode. I don't I don't want to give it short shrift. You know, I feel like, oh, well, it must not have been that great the way you're describing it. It really is one that you have to watch cuz this is another one where where it, it focuses so much on Koran, who can be a very funny character depending on how they write him. This is kind of like the one where he kept uh where they were going backwards like through the wormhole and he was reverse aging. <laughs> And they kept making him do all these silly things, you know, depending on how old he was at the time. It was kind of like that. What did, you, what did you think of the Voltron show? Uh, I loved with um, with him, once he got the slug in his brain, the little brain leech. Once he had that going on, it was more of like a brain kick now that I think about it. Anywho, uh, once he got that going, uh, his directions pretty much turned it turned everything into a stereotypical uh, super robot or super sentai show where, like, everything is so bombastic and they jump and flip around to move just so that they can move. They yell everything. They pose. Like, it's totally fucking tokusatsu fun slash super robot. Really, the two kind of uh, cross after a while. But I just, I was, when I saw that, I'm like, oh, I love you guys. This is great. <laughs> do, you was so amusing. To, uh, do you listen to the Bruce Pritchard podcast? I I do not. I, I used to listen to Jim Cornette, and then I got yeah. He just, I felt like he was just going overboard, so I just gave up on him. All right. Well, Bruce Pritchard talks about how back in the the Hogan era, you know, Vince Vince one of Vince's catchphrases was Hogan must pose. So whatever happened at the end of the show, <laughs> Hogan. Hogan must pose in the ring, whether he won, lost, or or, or drew. And um, I that I when uh, when Koran was talking about and everyone strike a pose, that's all I could think about was Voltron must pose. Yeah, <laughs> I mean kids <laughs> love that shit, man. They do. They really they do. do. This I was a fun episode. Like crazy. Just, of the uh, the six episodes in this season, um, such as it was, if you want to call it that, uh, this one this one was the most fun. But then we get to our two part finale: begin the blitz and a new defender. A new defender really gave away what was going to happen. But uh, begin the blitz, uh, Voltron, with the coalition attack a. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to read this. With the coalition against Zarkon sufficiently large and in charge, the Blade of Mamora and Shiro construct a plan to reclaim one-third of the Galar Empire by taking down the Galar-occupied planet Nakzella. Prince Lotor leads his generals to the remains of Dizabal, where he has secretly erected a gate around the interreality rift where his mother had worked. Lotor uses the last of his contestants to enter the field between the realities to collect the infinite supply of contestants therein. The coalition begins its plan to reclaim part of the empire. Pigeon hunk disable a communication satellite, while the blade of Marmora and a team led by Matt hijack the large cannons so they uh, can use against the Galra. Once Akza, Exor, and Zethrid realize that Lotor's gate does not work. Axa stuns him with the intent to return to Zarkon in exchange for a pardon. However, Lotor manages to escape his handcuffs once he once he wakes and flies away in his cruiser. The satellite that and dislocates his own shoulders. Yeah, it's like, 
I saw that. The satellite that Tej and Hunk have disabled begins to work again, and Hagar learns of the Empire's defeat. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and skip forward here, just so we can talk about both uh, episodes at the same time. Uh, a new defender, the Coalition's success is, ab- is abruptly interrupted when an incoming Galra cruiser remotely disables the Galra technology they were using. Lotor is spotted by the Empire in deep space and is pursued by Zarkon's fleet, only narrowly escaping. Hagar, focused on stopping the Coalition's tirade, begins a ritual that traps Voltron on Nexala's surface by multiplying, Daka multiplying, the intensity on, of the planet's gravity. Unable to move Voltron, the Paladins flee to the planet's core to find and disable the source of energy causing the gravity change. There, Allura attempts to disarm the planet's energized core to no success. Hunk observes the planet's soil as highly volatile, leading to the Paladins to realize the planet is being used as a bomb. It's a b it's a b no, it's a bomb that will detonate when a Galra cannon fires at it. Unable to communicate, Keith and Matt confront the oncoming Galra cruiser. While listening to Galra communications, Lotor learns about the impeding, ex- impending explosion and heads towards it. As the Palatins try to escape Naxala, Lance encourages Allura to use her Altaian abilities to overcome the planet's gravity, which she manages to do. After Voltron, the Blade, and Matt's team regroup, they realize they cannot disarm the cannon on the Galra cruiser without taking down its force field. After their attempts to shoot it fail, Keith nearly sacrifices himself to ram into the shield before a powerful blast from Lotor's cruiser destroys it. Lotor asks the Coalition to have a discussion, quote-unquote, despite their differences in the past. Yes, despite the fact that he was their enemy, they are... uh, going to adopt him into the coalition. And that's where we end season four. So, uh, again, this <laughs> it's a trap. Um, this is our two part episode where they, you know, it was a big invasion of Naxala. Uh, first they get the upper hand and then the, then Hagar turns the, the tables on them. They spend the entire second episode fighting gravity. Uh, Keith almost kills himself and Lotor saves the day. What did you think of Begin the Blitz, uh, Ballroom Blitz, and a new Defender? Uh, I was kind of disappointed, one, that they killed the cat lady so early, because uh, I love cats. <laughs> like, I felt like that was, because, you know, it was when they built, they built all of them up to be so cool, and at the end of the day, they didn't do a whole lot. At least I didn't feel like, in terms of, like... Okay. Uh, I, I guess lasting longer. They all were like just kind of like, eh, whatever. I felt like that maybe was just a miss. Uh, just a missed opportunity for now. But in terms of like the two parter, yeah, yeah, yeah. Low tours. Gonna join the team for now until he betrays them because he's a dick. But it was it was cool to see you know Keith uh, taking that responsibility. Uh, jump on the grenade of sorts, sacrifice himself, and then Lotor's like, nah, bro, I got you. Just kind of jump in there and <laughs> use a fire in his laser. Also, the uh, Voltron went Super Saiyan. Just uh, managed to power through there. It was, it was, it was something. Honestly, as, a, as like a two-part finale, I liked it, but kind of felt like it hit on story beats that a lot of other shows have done before. From where I'm sitting, so I, I don't know. I felt like slightly let down, but I'm really intrigued to see where it went, where it's going. I think overall, this season four, I like. I guess I understand why Netflix broke it up. I mean, we got two seasons. We got we got two seasons in the same year, as opposed to having to wait a whole other year for a second season. But quite frankly, I really wish they would have just released three and four together as just the third season, and then I'll wait a year for season a, a proper season four. Um, it definitely season four and season three work well together. Separately, I they're not nearly as strong um, because they are telling this they are telling this one story of sort of the rise and fall of Lotor. Um, yeah, and the changes within the the changes within the Voltron line. It was, 
this whole thing, thinking back to season three and, and looking at this one, this whole thing just felt very transitional. Um, you know, it was, I think after season two, it was where they, where, yeah, it was, it was season two where they dealt a crushing blow to the Galra Empire. And then it was like this season, they, they were sort of building on that. There was a lot of turmoil on the team. They had to introduce Lotor and his plot. And it was like, okay, they put all these elements in place now. Season four should kick some serious ass. This, when I think back on both three and four, just felt like th- this was the connective tissue to get to something better. Yeah, I could agree with that. I can. It's it's the transitional champion in a way. Like it's like oh yeah yeah man. It, it was good it was a thing but uh really felt like uh, what came before or you know what came before and what came after it are uh, a little more important. Which we'll see how true that is, but. Yeah, I'm excited to see what they do with season four now. Um, I mean, none of none of Voltron's been bad. I just no. you know, season one and season two were exponentially stronger than both of these seasons. Uh, so we'll you know we'll see what happens. Do you have a uh, a final thought or a final word? Anything left unsaid about uh, season four of Voltron? I did like it. I would watch it again. Uh, I think watching it together with three, three and four together would really uh, bring a lot of perspective into uh, both seasons and separately to kind of see where that one long narrative goes. Because I really felt like they had Lotor really uh, kind of building himself up to be uh, somebody really worth uh, fighting against. And I think they kind of just pulled the rug out under him to kind of, I don't know, to almost just kind of have the status quo back in some ways. But at the same time, uh, I mean, this is a, it's a fairly well-written show. It's smartly written. I'm interested in seeing when he's going to betray them. Because it's like, it's like Vince McMahon and Stone Cold teaming up together. You're like, okay, when are they going to turn? When's it going to turn? Like, it's not going to last. Yeah. My suspicion is that even though Lotor is on the outs with the Empire, the long game is to be the Emperor himself. Um, he if, just can't wait. Know, to like, be I don't king. think he. Well, I don't think he wants to be Emperor. I think he feels like he has to be Emperor in order to save his own hide. You know, like he has to eliminate Hagar and Zarkon um, and be the Emperor to you know to protect himself. And so I think, you know, he's going to use the coalition in Voltron long enough to get to that point, and then he'll take over the Empire himself. What he does with the Empire, well, we'll you know, who knows? But uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see if I'm right about that. Uh, that's the end of our show. It's a short one tonight. But then again, we didn't have a whole lot to discuss here. We only had six episodes to look at. So um, Voltron will be back next year. I don't know exactly when. Let me take a look real quick. Uh, Voltron season five. Whoop, do season five. Uh, will Lotor join Team Voltron in season five? Um, who knows? All right, let's uh, let's look at Den of Geek here. So, so Voltron season five. Everything we know. Well, do we know when it's coming back? That's what I'm asking. Uh. Season 5 release date. With the start of Season 3, Voltron started releasing episodes in smaller chunks. Uh, This is what led to shorter wait time between 3 and 4. This makes predicting the Voltron Season 5 release date tricky. So, all right, they really don't know then. Um, If it's another three-month deal, it'll probably be January, February, sometime in there. Um, This article says it might even go as far as March. But we'll see. Uh, obviously, so obviously, there's no set release date just yet. But we'll get it. To, we'll get seasons five and six sometime in 2018. And your friend and your friend and mine, Robert Cooper, will be there to review it with me. And probably so will Robert Winfrey, who couldn't make it tonight because he has uh, laryngitis. He has no voice, so that sucks. But but you know, it is what it is. 
Uh, tomorrow night on the Metal Hammer of Doom, uh, we'll be reviewing the new Marilyn Manson, Her- um, Heaven Upside Down Face. And <laughs> next week, we've got uh, Planet Hulk on source material. Damn You Hollywood is going to be reviewing Geostorm. Uh, the Metal Hammer yeah. of Doom welcomes Robert Cooper back with Stray from the Path, his favorite band. And then we're going <laughs> to... We're going to give this a shot again. Uh, Sean Comer and I will attempt to do an on trial for Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. So that's what we got going on here. Uh, Uh, You want to do any plugs? Uh, Well, there's uh, that metal podcast. I'm on it. Yep. I'm actually, I told Mark, I'm moving to a 9 to 6 shift on a permanent basis. Well, I don't know how permanent it'll be because I think uh, it came from the top of management down, and I think it's a really bad idea. But, you know, hey, I get to reap the spoils of I can go to work at 9 and get off at 6. Hey, that's my favorite shift. You can go to bed at 12, get up at 8, fully rested. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's that uh, Sentai Rider podcast, uh, the thing I still haven't done in like three years. Uh, but I'm still watching Common Rider Build every week. I don't think my buddy Hunter is. He might. I need to talk to him sometime. Yeah, uh, you can find us at Facebook, facebook.com slash Sentai Podcast. That is S-E-N-T-A-I-R-I-D-E-R Podcast. Uh, W2Mnet.com, uh, my buddy Sean Garmer's website, where they have tons of uh, articles on wrestling and video games and some entertainment and stuff like that. I was in their uh, New Japan Kings of Pro Wrestling uh, preview guide, so even though I've not watched that event, it's a week old now. Oops. Uh, so, yeah, go check that out. Uh, we share podcasts with them. I think they're now available on uh, Amazon Alexa, if I'm not mis- if, uh, I think he just said. So the whole site's available there. So that's neat. Uh, and then uh, scrapingthebottom.com, my buddy uh, Kevin. I was on there once. I've not been called back since, but I'm sure I'll show <laughs> up again and I'll bring cake. Because when I came, he brought cake. And so like, I feel like if I show up again, I need to bring cake for everybody. Because, you know... What's diabetes, really? Someone left my cake out in the rain. Someone left a cake out in the rain. <laughs> yes. All right. So that uh, brings us to a close here. For Mr. Robert Cooper, I am your mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Radlich. This has been TV Party Tonight, reviewing Voltron Legendary Defender Season 4. Be well, be safe. Behave.